everybody. Welcome to the first Pat Dooley show. That's me up there, and, and it's me right here. Pat Dooley, Sports Commons of the Gainesville Sun. We're going to do this weekly, and you can just go on your computers, and we'll talk a lot about Gator sports. This is kind of a pilot episode. I wanted to call it I Dooley after the iCarly show. What, you don't watch Nickelodeon? You don't have an eight-year-old? So instead, they decided on the Pat Dooley show. We're going to have special guest interviews. We're going to play a couple of games on this show as well, and it should be a lot of fun. We're coming up on the most anticipated season in Florida history. And the reason I say that is that when, Florida's been number one before. They have a preseason number one in 94, but you weren't thinking national title. Preseason number one in 97, lost Werfel, lost Bates, lost so many seniors. Preseason number one in 2001, but at the same, I don't think anybody was really thinking national title until the season went along. When they won their national titles, 96, you're still nursing the wounds from the Nebraska game. In 2006, nobody went in there thinking national championship team. And in 2008, you know, you didn't know what your defense was going to be like because the defense had been so poor before. So I think it's the most anticipated season we've ever seen at Florida, which, of course, makes it exciting. And we're almost through with the summer of stupid, so all the dumb things aren't going to be happening anymore. There's going to be a lot of uh, target. The target's going to be on their backs. There's going to be a lot of media covering them. And uh, so we'll see how all that goes. And it's also, and I wrote a column about this, it's not just a, a schedule, it's not just a season coming up, it's a farewell tour. This is the last time we're going to see Tim Tebow play for the Florida Gators. We know that now, after he decided to come back. It's the last time we're going to see Brandon Spikes play for the Florida Gators, some of the other seniors. It's the last time we're going to see a lot of these juniors play as well. Aaron Hernandez, Joe Hayden, the Pouncey Twins, Carlos Dunlap. These are all guys who could very well be gone after this season's over and expect them to be. So in a lot of ways, it's a little bit of a farewell tour, and it, it, it's going to be a little melancholy at times uh, when you think about it. But the excitement level's through the roof. Everybody's always asking me when I'm going to make my prediction. Well, I've, I've decided on this already. I picked Oklahoma to beat Florida in the national title game. I'm never picking against Tebow again. Florida, 14-0, national title, Pasadena. We'll have a great time out there. I'm not picking against Tebow anymore. You don't even need to read my picks. Florida over whoever. Just put it that way. Now, there are some concerns with this Gator team. I think the biggest to me isn't so much who's replacing Percy Harvin, but who's going to replace Lewis Murphy, their go-to guy, the guy they kept hitting on those ends, 15-yard in routes, the guy they hit on those fades. You remember the big fade pattern against Alabama that he caught? Uh, is it going to be Riley Cooper? I'm curious to see if his heart is in it. I mean, he obviously has got the baseball thing waiting for him. I want to see that. You're not going to see that. You can, they can talk all they want about practice. You're not going to see that with Riley Cooper until he gets into a game, a uh, big game, and they decide he's the guy they need to go to. Uh, is it going to be David Nelson? Great finish to the season. First time we've seen David Nelson, really. Uh, caught, I think it was 11 passes in the last five games for five touchdowns. That's pretty good. But as a go-to guy, never been that. Deontay Thompson waiting for him to emerge. So I think that's the number one concern, and the number two concern to me is the tackle situation. They're trying to figure out who they're going to be. They'll have that resolved, but the, the problem is pre two pretty good ones, Jim Watkins and Phil Troutwine out there, and they're going to miss them uh, this season. So those, to me, are the two big concerns. Defensively, I have no concerns. I think they are going to be stout. They're going to try to dominate. They didn't dominate last year, led the SEC in most first downs allowed. I bet you didn't know that. So we'll see how the defense plays. All right, we're going to take a break, our first break, first ever commercial break. Then we're going to come back with my interview with the first lady of Gator football, Shelly Meyer. All right, welcome back to the Pat Dooley Show, the inaugural Pat Dooley Show. And our first guest, of course, we went to the first lady of Florida football, Shelly Meyer, joins me right now. Shelly, how are you? Doing great. Having a great day so far. Now, we are in the swamp in this game week. Shelly, where, where are your seats? Where do you sit? Section 9, right over there. Okay. I kind of I kind of wish I sat a little bit lower so I could see the players a little bit better, but I, I can see the whole field, and that's most important. Well, you know who to talk to to get better seats. I do know the guy, but <laughs> I'm happy with what I have. Well, this is your fifth year, and you've not been a place five years, uh, really, have you? Maybe Notre Dame? M Notre Dame. Five yeah. years at Notre Dame. So what's it like for you? How is it different for you in the, here in the fifth year? Well, well, you know what's great about being here and uh, winning and having job securities? I know we're not going to be picking up moving anytime right. soon. I mean, the other, the other head coaching jobs Urban had, I knew. I knew it wouldn't be permanent. I knew he was climbing and at any time, you know, another job would come along that was a great step and, and we'd be on the move. When he takes another Dick James job after this year, I'm sure that you'll have to Pat, come on. <laughs> Just he's, cut it right he's now. He's not going to Notre Dame. All right. <laughs> 
Have you gotten used to the humidity yet here, though? Oh yes. I mean, <laughs> coming from Utah now, that was a huge, that was a huge deal getting used to that because, of course, I grew up in Ohio. It's very humid and hot in the summer up there. But after you spend two years in Utah, you move here, and then you know you go back to the flat hair, the frizzy hair, <laughs> all that. But I, I figured out how to combat all that. How gloomy is it around your house after a loss? I mean, is that a bad? I'm sure it's a bad night. I'm sure it's a bad Sunday. It's real. I, I mean, it's just it's so deflating and depressing. I, there's no way I could put it into words because as bad as Gator fans feel after we lose, nobody feels worse than Urban. Nobody. You, you can't. And, and there's no argument there. And our kids know. They know it's just going to be a miserable night. They, we can't do anything <laughs> to make him feel better. I think that's the hardest part is we're helpless to make him feel better. I was going to ask you, is there a meal you can make that he would pick him up or? No. There's no pick me he up He wouldn't meal? even eat. He, he doesn't even want to eat. He only eats because he has to. Okay, what's a typical, let's just say for a 7 o'clock game like you have in the opening week, what's your typical game day like? Well, I, I kind of love the 7 o'clock start because I'm not rushing around in the morning right. getting all my tailgate things ready, trying to get my pregame run in and get the kids all situated. So what I'll do is I'll get up in the morning and I'll go for my run, do my workout, get the laundry done. I get to do, you know, if I need to mow, I can mow for a couple of hours. Do you mow the yard? I, I do mow the yard. I'm, wow, I so love to mow. We have something in common. Yeah. Do you ride it or do you <laughs> push it? I'm a pusher. I'm a pusher too. I love yeah. it. So um, I've got some time to feel. They have a service, you know. You can you can hire somebody <laughs> to do. It. I, you know, when I'm not home, I, enough days to mow, I do have a service come and help me out. Um, but I can get a lot of things done at the right. house and and not feel like I'm going to be behind when the week starts. So I I will just do all that kind of thing and um, and then come on over here. Let's see, seven o'clock. I'll be over here by about four o'clock probably and just uh, now after the if it's a day game do you like have a party after the game if we win if, you win. if we win <laughs> we end up inviting people over we usually always have a house full for every home game so we've already got and that's what's really hard about losing is then those people have to witness what happens after a loss and it's not fun and it's not even fun having company right well obviously your daughter's gone she's in Atlanta playing volleyball you were up there this weekend <laughs> They beat we Georgia, were, right? Not, not bad at all. It was a great win for Georgia Tech. They have a really good volleyball team. They're going to be uh, a, a team that's I think is going to do real well this year. And we just love seeing our daughter. We we sat across from her just so we could look at her. We didn't really get to visit with her all that much because they were so busy. It was an invitational. They played all weekend. But um, just seeing her and talking to the coaches and and just uh, spending dinner time with her and, and watching her team play. We had a great weekend up there. Are you used to it now that she's not there? You've got the empty bedroom? Yeah, we, we teased her. Urban teased her and said uh, he ordered the Bowflex the day after she moved out. <laughs> we were turning her room into an exercise room. But, of course, we didn't do that. She, her room's still there, but it's quite bare. And I, I have a feeling there are going to be guests staying in it this fall. Now, you played some bocce ball with James Bates. i got to ask you, who's better at bocce ball, you or uh, Urban? Well, I have to tell you that I witnessed, and uh, I, I was just a fan. I did okay, not play. play. <laughs> don't understand the rules, don't know anything about it. I know Urban played, and since James is the one that has the bocce court in his yard, I, I'm sure he's the better player. Yeah, well, I, I've never played myself either. Have you ever offered Urban a, a football suggestion in your career? Uh, absolutely. I. I I, I'm in his ear all the time about what I like to see on the field, and he, you know what he says? Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your advice. That's what he That's says what to he me, says. too. <laughs> <laughs> Give me an example of something you would say to him. Well, I, you know, I love the spread offense. Yeah. Ever since he's been a head coach and been running that, I absolutely love it. And I loved some of the plays we used to run at some other schools that were a little more tricky. And uh, you know, now that we're here and we have all these fast guys, we don't yeah. have to be we don't have to be so tricky. But I'm always calling for, you know, the double reverse or the halfback pass or some kind of really fun play that just gets everybody just going crazy and he's just, he you know, he just doesn't have to do that much anymore. So I remember watching the uh, Fiesta Bowl when when he was at Utah and he ran the bubble screen pitch back to the tailback and I said that guy's going to do all right here. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. that hook and ladder thing. I, I wish I could see that again, but I have to watch other teams to see that. Yeah. Well, he'll maybe bring it back for the Charleston Southern game. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. Not for that game. Well, I, I appreciate you joining me as the first guest on the first Pat Dooley show. Shelly Meyer, we'll be right back. You read the games, well, son, you know how much I love lists. I like to rank everything. Uh, Pat Dooley's been going to games since 1962, and I've had some openers that I, to me were the most memorable. So these are the most memorable openers for myself. And number five, we'll start there. 
Florida, Oklahoma State, 1990. Steve Spurrier's first game. The reason it, it resonates with me, it was a blowout, of course, as you know, is we got a glimpse right away, this is what we're in for. It wasn't anymore the pounding, you know, run, 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 punt, uh, that kind of mentality that we'd seen when Emma Smith was here and, of course, with, with uh, Coach Hall and Coach Darnell for the last part of that year. This was wild and crazy up and down the field, throw it, throw it, throw it. Shane told me a great story, Shane Matthews, that he was hoping this Spurs first play would be a draw or a screen so he could kind of get used to it. He goes, no, nah, no, nah, we're going to throw it, throw it down the field. And it went right down the field. Dexter McNabb, by the way, scored the first touchdown. Great trivia question. The number four favorite game goes back a ways. The University of Cal and the University of Florida played in Tampa, Florida in 1980. This was a Gator team coming off 0-10-1. 30th anniversary, by the way, if you read my column about that. 30 years ago, Florida went 0-10-1. It's hard to believe nowadays. But that Cal team came in here with Rich Campbell and Chuck Muncie, went down to Tampa, very good team, and Florida uh, just annihilated them. They were ready. They had everything in place. They finally had some quarterback. All the injuries from the, the year before had been healed, and they were ready to play. 42-13, the Gators beat Cal that day. Never forget that game as long as I live. Number three, you won't like Gator fans out there, but it's a 1984 Miami game again in Tampa. That game was amazing. There was so much talent on the field, maybe as much talent on the field as I've ever seen for a Florida opener. And as you know, Florida with Kerwin Bell had taken the lead and had a chance till Bernie Kosar threw the game-winning touchdown pass and a last uh, second desperation pass by Kerwin was picked off and run back for a touchdown. But there were so many NFL players on that field on both sides. It's just one of those games that you never forget uh, being at. The number two game is another Miami game, opening day. Remember when Florida 81 to 85 always opened with Miami? Well, 82 was the day that James Jones made the catch. And of course, uh, Wayne Peace hit him in the corner of the end zone, although he really never got into the end zone. And James Jones will be the first to admit it. He, he made the incredible one-handed catch and fell about the one half yard line, but the referee gave him a touchdown and Florida won that game. Jim Kelly gave James Jones a hard time about that. He told me when I wrote my book, Game of My Life, he said that uh, you didn't get in. He goes, well, we would have gotten in eventually and you wouldn't have any time to come back. And they didn't come back anyway. But uh, certainly that was a memorable game for a lot of people, just known as the catch these days. And number one, and here's the interesting thing about number one, number one is going to be number one forever. You know why? Because Florida never plays anybody in their openers anymore. So I can't imagine an opener being more memorable than the 1969 game against Houston. A lot of you know the story, Sports Illustrated, Playboy, had Houston number one the preseason, Elmo Wright coming in here, Florida, a bunch of nobodies, John Rees, Carlos Alvarez, who are these guys? Tommy Durrance, and Florida just destroyed them, scoring 59 points. People at halftime were lining up to buy tickets. They'd listen to the game on the radio. They wanted to be a part of it. It was an amazing thing. It's still the one that I'll never forget. Number one opener all time at Florida. All right, that's going to do it for that segment of the list. When we come back, Robbie Andrews is going to join me. We're going to do a segment we like to call Either Or here on the Pat Dooley Show. Welcome back to our new segment, which is called Either Or. We're going to do this every week with somebody. Of course, had to pick the superstar to come on first, Robbie Andrew, the Gainesville Sun. Robbie, welcome to the show. Thanks. You're desperate for talent, I can see. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, and the first question, we're going to ask Robbie, which one is it? Either Or. Is it the fact that Bobby Bowden said that Charlie Ward is better than Tim Tebow? Was that the most ridiculous thing you heard last week? Or was it when Lou Holtz picked Notre Dame to play for the national title? It was Holtz to me. I mean, Charlie Ward was a great player that one year. He won the Heisman, right? He did. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, yeah. He won in the swamp, which people don't do. Lou Holtz picking Notre Dame, that's it's a real reach. I don't get it. It's getting old. You know? It's a bad schedule they play, but I don't. that one's <laughs> not going to work. USC's on it, and they yeah. aren't getting there with one... Uh, loss and, and Southern Cal is not going to lose to them, but no. I, I still I, I agree. I, Charlie Ward was a wonderful player, Robbie, and we saw him play. Of course, the biggest pass he ever threw went about six yards. In yeah, the air. The, and then there was the, a block in the, the back. The, the flat, yeah, there was, there was. But um, the bottom line is, yeah, picking Notre Dame to play for the national title. If it was anybody else, you go, hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. But when it's Holtz, who loves Notre Dame and wears it on his sleeve, and that's just stupid. And I agree with you 100% on that. Either or, Robbie, Georgia loses its opener to Okie State. Or Alabama loses its open to Virginia Tech? I think Georgia goes down in this one, Pat. I think Oklahoma State's had a great offense. It's on the road, breaking in a new quarterback. Alabama's breaking in a new quarterback, too, against a good defense. But, you know, Virginia Tech doesn't have much of an offense. So I think Alabama shuts Virginia Tech down. I think Georgia gets spanked a little bit. I, I saw a stat I, uh, which stunned me the other day. I think Virginia Tech threw five or six touchdown passes last year all year. Yeah. 
I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. And Alabama's defense is going to be rugged again this year. Uh, I'm with you on this one. I, I, I hate to agree with you all the time, but I, I, I'm picking Georgia to beat Okie State, but of the either or, I would say Georgia losing yeah. to Oklahoma you know, you State. Can, yeah, I can say how you would pick Georgia, though, because it's the, pack, the Big 12 and the sure. SEC again, and we saw it happen last year in the bowl game. So. All right, either or, Robbie. Florida scores 70 points in the opening game, or they deliver a shutout. Can I say yes, yes on that? <laughs> I don't think it'll be the shutout. Okay. I'll tell you why. Late in the game, you know, they yeah. got, got guys in there. Uh, and they've been game planning for the Gators all, all summer. So yeah. they'll get seven or three one way or another. But the 70 points seems to be uh, uh, locked. Yeah, know. but I think 70 is locked. But I think a shutout is a really good possibility, Pat, because the competition on that defense now, when yeah. you put third team guys in there, they're like prey all American stuff like that. So I see a shutout in that game. See a shutout, okay. I, you know, the Danny Sheridan had him favored by 73. Not that he has anything official to do yeah. with any betting. He'll cover that, I bet. Well, but you can't bet on it. because no. they, It's just because Danny yeah. Sharon said it. But 73 points, they, they could cover. All right, either or, Robbie, the first touchdown Florida scores this year. Is it Tim Tebow or are you taking the field? Taking the field on this. Are one. you? Jeff Demps, 48 yards. Well, I like your theory, thinking that somebody's going to break one early. Yeah, that's, that's why I'm thinking that. But I'm going to go with pushed out at the one-yard line that they, they, Tebow plunges in. So I'm going to take Tebow on that Okay. One. We'll see who was right next week. But next up, Dr. Football answers a question from his email bag. All right, so let's see what question Dr. Football got in the email bag. All right, Mr. Scott Erker is asking, Dr. Football, in the if the 2009 Florida Gators repeat as national champs and Tim Tebow wins a second Heisman Trophy, which are both favored to do, will T Tim Tebow be the first ever to achieve this feat of three national championships and two Heismans? Well, the answer is yes, he will. Of course, Archie Griffin's the only other guy to win two Heismans. Ohio State did not win the national championship in either one of his years, although they were given the Matthew Grid Ratings National Championship. Now, the Matthew uh, is a computer formula they still use today in the computerized part of the BCS. Oklahoma, though, was the team to beat then. Oklahoma won the AP uh, national title in both years. So, yes, Tim Tebow, uh, if he wins another Heisman, another national championship, he will be the only guy to ever do those two things. And I think we'll have to make the argument for the greatest player ever. Like I've said, though, all along, wait till after this year. Then I'll tell you whether he's the greatest I've ever seen. Well, that's going to do it for the first edition of the Pat Dooley Show. I want to thank everybody for clicking on and seeing it. And I want to thank Robbie Andrew and Shelley Meyer for being my first guests. Till next time, Pat Dooley saying so long from the Sunshine State.